I am Truth, and this is a story about a boy who tried to break me. Truth and lies during one of the world's darkest times. For years he hid during the Holocaust and after it, changing names, changing lives. It's a story author Mitch Album tells in his new book, The Little Liar. In the most hopeless of times, hope is what gets us through. And, and ultimately, The Little Liar is a book about hope. And it's the reader's choice of the CBS New York Book Club. Right now, CBS New York's Book Club with Mary Calvi. Hello, welcome to our first book club meetup of the new year. Behind me are some of our book club members. We read books that are connected to the tri-state area in their plots or through their authors. For a little over a month, we've been reading The Little Liar by Mitch Album. Mitch was born in Passaic, New Jersey and started his writing career in Queens with The Little Liar. He has created an unforgettable story about the power of love and forgiveness. And our book club members showed up like they always do. Thousands of you cast your vote to decide this reader's choice. We made up mid-read virtually. Producer Danielle Parker was with me. Now, I don't know about you, Danielle, but I was filled with emotion during this book. Mary, there were so many emotions reading this book. Many members said they felt anger and joy, sadness and hope. Some even took notes while reading the book, saying the parables impacted them deeply. Here are some of their comments. It was just like peeling an onion. You just kept getting more and more layers. Every time I read a book that includes um, the Holocaust, it shocks me that people could be this cruel. That the narrator was um, truth. For me, that changed the whole way of reading it. I loved reading about the four main characters, and they were so connected, but they didn't always know it at the time. One thing that struck me was the little boy who couldn't lie. He ended up being a collaborator by what he was doing, but he was an innocent collaborator. He had no idea. Just thinking about how he had to struggle with what he did and just forgiving himself is the hardest part of that. It's just one of those books that touches you deeply and keeps you thinking about the characters long after the last page. Well, I had the incredible opportunity to sit down with author Mitch Album, whose books have garnered praise throughout the world. If you think this story is about a young boy realizing his dream of being an author, you'd be wrong. As a little boy growing up in New Jersey, would you have ever imagined that you would have 40 million copies of your book sold? No, because I never aspired to that. I never wrote for in my high school newspaper. I never wrote for my college newspaper or anything. I was a musician through and through. And it was only after music started, didn't work out, I volunteered for a local newspaper. Internationally renowned best-selling author Mitch Album began his writing career at the weekly supermarket paper, the Queen's Tribune. Believe me, when I was like putting the ads together at the Queen's Tribune, you know, <laughs> and trying to, you know, get the scores from the local high schools, I wasn't thinking 40 million copies of a book. I was just thinking, I wonder if I can one day get them to give me some money for doing this. <laughs> Album went on to become a well-known sports writer, and you might think, well, the rest is history, but not exactly. For the first 37 years of my life, I was mostly just about myself. And then I encountered an old professor of mine, Maury Schwartz, and he was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease. And really, the first visit I went was out of guilt. And he was so calm and so in control and content with how he had led his life. And I began to go back the next Tuesday, the next Tuesday, the next Tuesday, all the Tuesdays that he had left in his life. As a result of that, I did really what was the first nice thing of my life for somebody else. I wrote the book Tuesdays with Maury to pay his medical bills. We came to this city, New York, trying to find a publisher and got turned away virtually everywhere. They, everywhere? Almost, they almost threw us down the Tuesdays steps. Tuesdays with Maury was turned everywhere. down? Everywhere. Boring, depressing, you're a sports writer, nobody's going to want to read it. I would have given up. Mitch, I'm stunned. Yeah, I'm stunned true. to hear that. But because it was for somebody else, I kept pushing. We found one publisher was willing to publish it. They gave us enough money to pay his medical bills. I went off to write it after Maury passed away, which is interesting because people don't often realize Maury Schwartz never read a word of Tuesdays with Maury. He not never got word. to read it. Never, never, not one word. But yet he's being taught all over the world, mm -hmm. and his voice goes on. 
and so has the voice of album. From Tuesdays with Maury, which has sold more than 20 million copies, came The Five People You Meet in Heaven, The Stranger in the Lifeboat, The Timekeeper, and time after time, Mitch Albom's books topped the bestseller lists. We met at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Manhattan to speak about his latest work. I always say it takes me a year, a year and a lifetime <laughs> to write a book, because it takes a year to physically do it, but yes, it takes a right. lifetime to think the ideas that ultimately lead you right. to that point. A lifetime of experiences can be found in the pages of his books and in his latest, The Little Liar. I am truth, and this is a story about a boy who tried to break me. For years he hid during the Holocaust and after it, changing names, changing lives. But in the end, he must have known I would find him. Who could spot a little liar better than me? An instant New York Times bestseller and chosen by thousands of readers of the CBS New York Book Club as its reader's choice. For me, true love is easy. It's the kind where you do not lie to yourself. The novel set during World War II is a powerful one. Here at the museum, we sat within an exhibit called What Hate Can Do. It teaches about Holocaust history through personal items and stories, including the lives of Greek Jews. Some 60,000 died during the Holocaust. Most after boarding trains to Auschwitz, more than 80% of Greece's Jewish population perished. I always wanted to write one story set during the Holocaust, but I didn't want to do it like every other Holocaust book has been done. I didn't want to start at the start of a concentration camp and, and when liberation comes. And I kept waiting to come up with some idea. And then I thought, what if it's a boy who's never told a lie in his life? And the first lie that he tells is the worst lie he's ever going to tell. And I said, OK, that's a book. And um, that's how The Little Liar was born. A shiver shoots through Nico's body. In his mind, he sees his mother yelling his name, running toward him on the platform. He sees his father and grandparents and little sisters calling out for him. Tears begin to stream down his cheeks. The large man had been right. Nico was the liar. What do you hope people get from the little liar? What do you hope they take with them? The truth is precious, and we can't destroy it willy-nilly, and that it takes work to find the truth. Now let's welcome best-selling author, journalist, and philanthropist Mitch Albom joining us live from his home. First of all, congratulations on all of your success with The Little Liar. Thank you. It's good to see you again, Mary. Oh, so good to see you as well. Every one of your books brings with it this beautiful message, a life lesson for all of us. We had the chance to hear what inspired you to write Tuesdays with Maury, the number one best-selling memoir of all time, by the way. But what about this one? What about The Little Liar? Well, I wanted to write a book about truth, and I wanted to write a book about how precious it is, and a book that kind of asked the question, what's the biggest lie you ever told, and what would you do to be forgiven that lie? And so, you know, I found that what I felt was a really perfect setting, a, a time in history where lying was really at its most dangerous, powerful, evil uh, use, and that during, during the Holocaust. And, you know, how a little boy gets tricked into lying and what the consequences of that lie are. We often talk about, you know, tell the truth, don't lie, but we don't often say, well, what happens if you do? And then what would you do to be forgiven from that? Who do you have to make amends with? So um, that was my inspiration. And, uh, you know, the story seems to have worked out okay. It certainly did. And there was such a beautiful technique you used just right from the very start. We learn of the narrator of the story. Yeah. Yeah, that I think, honestly, Mary, when I look back on it now that it's finished, that was probably the thing that kind of lifted the little liar into a, you know, a different, a different realm, if you will, than other books that have been written about the subject, because truth tells the story. And once I decided the truth would be the narrator and the book, book would essentially begin, you know, you can trust the story you're about to hear. You can trust it because I'm the only thing in the world you can trust. I'm the shadow that finds your final reflection. You know, I'm the mirror that you can't escape. I'm truth. So when lies are being told, the narrator can come out and say, look what you're doing to me. Look, look at how you're destroying me. I'm a virtue. I'm precious. And look at what you did to me. And when you say it like that, it's much different than if a character says it or a first person narrator says it. Um, and, you know, we're all a little afraid of the truth. And so the narrator has a little bit of, a, of, a, of an edge because 
you realize like you're being told a story by truth it's got to be true and and maybe it's looking at you a little funny too and so um <laughs> It, it turned out to be a really good device. It's true because it didn't make me question truth and uh, whether I've been as truthful as I can be. So that's something that I really enjoy when I read your books. And you had said something really interesting that every one of your books brings with it something you learned from Maury, from Tuesdays with Maury. What life lesson from him did you offer us this time? Forgiveness. Mm. Uh, Maury was Maury was very very uh, big on forgiveness. You know, as he was dying from Lou Gehrig's disease, he pulled me aside one time, and you know, he said, "Mitch, if there's anybody you're fighting with or feuding with in your life that you care about, let it go. Just let it go. Say you're wrong if that'll end it. Because when you get to where I am, and you will get to where I am, you won't care who was right or wrong." You'll just want to know that you're at peace with them. You're, you've forgiven all the things between you. And so when Nico, the little boy in the book, tells this first lie of his life, which is the worst lie of his life, he basically spends the rest of his life, from the time he's 11 until the time he dies, trying to be forgiven for something that wasn't his fault, but something that he felt guilty about. And Fanny, the girl who is in love with him when she's 12 years old and can't stop thinking about him her whole life because he be she believes that he was wronged and she believes that he actually helped save her indirectly. She spends her whole life trying to find him to forgive him. And so the idea of our need to be forgiven and our need to forgive other people was essential in those two characters. And it's, it's, it's really the biggest part of if you drew, drew a line from Tuesdays with Maury over here to Little Liar over here, forgiveness would be, you know, the letters of the line because I took that really directly from my time with Maury. Oh, just so moving, really, and so powerful. How about we check in with our book club members, Danielle. Some of our readers got emotional while reading The Little Liar. I know I did. I'm getting emotional just hearing Mitch Album <laughs> talk about it again because everyone got emotional. One of our members, Darlene, said she would become overcome with emotion reading about Nico and about the other children in the beginning of the book. She said she would cry, put the book down, then pick it up again, then cry yet again. So after all this, Darlene wants to know how Mitch felt. There's just some parts that in the story that like, you know, you're like shocked. And then like, you know, I just wonder like how I was overwhelmed reading it, him writing it, was he like tear, teary eyed or like with a lot of emotions? I think that's a great question, Mitch. So everything you write makes me cry a little bit. Do you feel the same deep emotion in writing these stories as we do in reading them? I do. And um, that might seem strange to people, but I, I kind of have a litmus test that if I don't choke up a little bit um, or, or feel like a shiver or a tingle when I write something, it's not good enough. And I need to keep working on it until I do. I remember one, as I was listening to those comments, there was one particular scene, or as I was writing it, what, where when Nico, when his family is put on the trains and he wants to be with them, and Udo, the Nazi, uh, you know, in the story, grabs him by the neck and says, no, you stay. And he thinks he's doing him a favor because he knows that if he lets him go on the train, he's going to die. Uh, but Nico wants to be with his family. And after the train leaves, Nico jumps onto the tracks and starts running after the train, a little 11 year old boy mm -hmm. running after the train. And the Nazi soldiers standing on the tracks are pointing at him and laughing at him. And he's running and he's running and he's running. And I remember when I wrote that, I was like, I remember being a boy about that age and being lost one time. I, fa I couldn't find my family. We were at wherever we're at, I lost them and started running and running. And, and, and you don't know where you're running. You know, you don't know where they are. And that feeling of being lost and, and he just keeps running and his feet start bleeding and he just keeps running. And I remember getting choked up because I, I remember what that felt like to lose your family. In my case, I lost them for five minutes, you know, but just that feeling that you, you separated from them again. And um, I, I said, you know, I wrote it. I wrote it in such a way that it made me choke up. And so I said, OK, I've done all right here. And I, I, I try to do that with every scene that's that's emotional. So, yeah, I mean, I'm glad I'm really glad to hear the, the first woman who said I cried, I put it down, but then I picked it up again because I don't want you to cry and put it down and not pick it up again. <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, 
Yes, I do. I mean, I'm right with I'm right with the readers on that. Well, coming up next, our readers want to ask you about the places you visited for inspiration over these years, and one of them in particular that's actually not mentioned in this novel. I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about Haiti. But first, we asked our book club members what they thought of Nico, and the answers, they're complicated. Devastated yeah. for him. Yeah. yeah. I had mixed feelings. Yes, I, agree. I had mixed feelings. Who said yeah, mixed feelings, that's the answer. The Chalpoo's books always, there's always so much in it. So it always causes one to think. I was back and forth with him. He got his innocence robbed from him. Yep. And right. he could never get mm. that back. And as much as he tried to make up for it, he just couldn't. When you have your faith shaken like that and to come through the other side is pretty amazing. Right now, CBS New York's Book Club with Mary Calvi. And we are back speaking with Mitch Album. I'm so excited to talk to you. And one of the things I was wondering, and I know a lot of people probably ask you about this, but the actual writing process, like when do you write? Where do you write? Is there something that you follow throughout uh, your, your writing for each and every book that you do? I write right here in this room, a little off to the side. It's an office. It's in the basement of our house. Um, I write every morning, uh, even Saturdays and Sundays when I'm working on a book. I get up first thing in the morning, brush my teeth, get a little something hot to drink, and come right down here and start. I don't listen to anything. I don't turn on anything. I don't read anything else. I don't turn on music. I want my brain, the very first thing that I freshly do in the morning, to be the work that I'm working on. And then I work for maybe two and a half to three hours, and then that's it. I've learned that uh, you know I could sit there for the rest of the day and nothing else is gonna happen. That's kind of how much gas I have in my tank. And I always try to leave when things are going well. Like I don't get to a frustrated line or paragraph or idea and I go, oh, forget it, I'll just come back tomorrow. Because then when you wake up the next morning, you don't really want to come down, you know, because you've got that problem that you had before. But if you leave it right where it's going well, you're excited to get up the next morning and do it. So I, I found that that seems to work for me. And for all of your fans, so what do you read when you're not writing? Um, you know, I, I read for the craft of writing. So I'll read anything if it's if I'm told that it's good or I believe that it's good. It can be nonfiction. It can be fiction. It can be poetry. It could be dramas. It could be screenplays. I like to watch um, how other people write. And if I pulled some books over from the shelf here and pulled them off, you would see that they are dog eared and, and there's lines, you know, underlined. And, and a lot of times I'll just walk around here and pull books off and just examples of what I think are really good writing just to sort of surround myself with uh, with the craft that I am trying to work in by people that I think do it really well so um, there's no limit to what I'll read if I think the writing is good in it um, you know it, 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 like I say even screenplays or plays if, if I think the dialogue is excellent I want to learn from it so reading for me is a kind of a learning experience as much as a pleasurable experience Danielle has some more questions for you Mitch hang on that's right, we do, because our readers were invested in these characters. During our meetup, Roberta said that she loved the book. She loved that it portrayed a close, loving family. Roseanne said as a grandparent herself, she identified with the grandfather who tried to project hope. But Karen's question wasn't about the people, but about the place. I just wanted to ask, why did he choose Greece? Why did yeah. we, as the setting? very purposely because most holocaust books are set in poland or germany or france and they're stories that have been told before and i when i didn't want people to think oh there's a book that's part of it is about the holocaust i don't want to read i read i read all those books before um most people don't even realize that greece was even involved in the Holocaust or was invaded by the Nazis, let alone that the most majority Jewish city in all of Europe, including Poland, including Germany, including France, was in Greece, Thessalonica, Greece, where the story is, is, ta is taken. Some, I think 37% of the whole population was Jewish. They had 17 uh, newspapers that were Jewish, you know, newspapers, they had 30 synagogues and all of it was wiped out in less than three years. And and I wanted people to say, wow, you mean there's 
something about the Holocaust that I didn't even know about. I thought I heard everything about it because we live in a time where we actually have people denying that the Holocaust ever existed. I, I wanted to say not only did it exist, there's still stories to be told that you may not know about. And that's why I put it in Greece. How about we check back in with our book club members, Danielle? I love that. I feel like we're getting like this inside look inside Mitch Album's brain, much less his library. This is fantastic because as one of our members named Patrick said, there are are so many layers to the little liar and during our zoom people were curious about Mitch's research for the book he hinted at it but here's Roberta's question the question I have is about all the places that he visited as a story as the story went on when he went to Poland when he went to Hungary you know that he got people set in all of these different places. Did he have help in establishing that? Did he travel? Well, you heard the question about so many locations. Have you visited? How do you do the research about those locations, Mitch? Well, I'm fortunate. I've, I've, I've traveled to most of the places that I've written about there at some point in my life, been in all those countries. But when you're trying to recreate a scene from 1950 or, you know, 1948 or 1960 or Hollywood in 1970 or something, I can't say that I was there during that time. So you rely on you rely on research and you rely on other people's stories and accounts, um, photographs that you can take that you can kind of recreate something um and you know there was a story particularly in 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 this you know the, the part that's the most challenging is the concentration camp stuff you know which isn't a big part of the uh, of the uh of the book but obviously i was not thank goodness uh there for that and for that you have to rely on other people's accounts and stories and i did a lot of that i talked to a lot of survivors uh, I talked to a lot of people about what it was like afterwards uh, when I was over in Greece. Uh, what happened when they came back after the World War II, after the Holocaust? There's a scene in the book where Sebastian comes back to try to reclaim his family's home, and there's a man living in it. And the man says, well, this is my house. I paid for it. And Sebastian says, what do you mean your house? The Nazis took it from us. This is my house. This is where I grew up. He says, well, I bought it from a German and so it's mine now. And that really that stuff really took place. And, you know, Sebastian had to leave. He didn't have a home. And so a lot of it is is, is not just the where, it's the what. And it's the stories that took place there. My my favorite was uh, a moment where in during the concentration camps, which I this I took from a survivor who told me some stories about how they would always try to find something hopeful even in the worst conditions in a concentration camp they said cling to something hopeful hang on to something hopeful so i created a scene where at the end of the day the grandfather who one of your readers mentioned before was her favorite character he gathers all of his family members and the people in the barracks together and he forces them to say one good thing that happened that day and you would say well, one good thing that happened in a concentration camp. what could possibly be good so one person says you know um uh, I got an extra spoonful of soup. And one person says my rotted tooth fell out of my mouth. And one person says the guard who always beats me was off today and I didn't get beaten. And one person says I saw a bird, you know, and just that that human need to find something positive, a reason to get up tomorrow and be hopeful, um, I found to be the most inspiring thing. But when you set that story in a concentration camp, the where matters as much as the what. If I if I set that story in a suburb and we said, oh, let's all gather together at night in our suburban house and ask, say one good thing that happened to us, it's nice. But when you put that in a barracks and you describe the smell and you describe the, you know, the person out front having a cough so that the guards can't hear the people talking, whatever, then the setting becomes just as important as the story. I wanted to ask you about another location when you visit very often. You've created this incredible place for children in Haiti. And I, I wonder how much of that experience plays into your writing. Constantly. Yeah. Uh, I, I say that as I get older, adults make less and less sense to me and children are the only thing that, that, that do. And um, it's not an accident that, you know, Nico is 11 years old when the most important thing in his life happens to him because I am surrounded by children all the time now. I'm in Haiti every month. We have 65 kids there. 
I have 12 kids here in Michigan who go to universities all around here, and one of them is in medical school. And, and so we have a two-year-old that we're raising just outside this door. And so I am constantly surrounded by the wonder of children. And um, it, it, it influences my writing tremendously. Uh, Stranger in the Lifeboat uh, had, as one of its background stories, the loss of a, of a child, which we went through with Chica. You know, and this book has children and how they interrelate with one another, even against tragedy, which I see all the time in Haiti. I see 10 and 11 year olds and 12 year olds trying to find something to eat, you know, wearing bottles, plastic bottles on their feet as shoes with a string tied around it because they don't even have money for shoes, you know, and, 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 and begging for coins. And so um, I would say that, that the, the kids in Haiti, not only are they, not only does their presence affect me, but I actually let them read my books before I turn them into the publisher. Oh, because, really? Yeah, our kids read all the time. You know, Mary, we don't have we don't have TV. Sorry for the TV industry, but there's no no TVs in our orphanage and we don't have phones and we don't have computers. We don't there's no access to anything like that. So they read. Our kids just read, they read and they read and they read all the time. And so I actually give my books to some of the older kids, the 13, 14 years old and and they pass it around and they Give me some good ideas. You know, they, they've helped edit me a little bit. If they say, I didn't understand when this happened, I said, mm, well, I want to make it so a 14-year-old can understand it, so let me change it around. So they've, they've been actually very helpful in the writing process as well. Wow, what a story. Mitch, you're incredible, really, giving so many people hope. When we come back, what is next for Mitch Album? He'll tell us himself. But first, I'm curious about how long it took our book club members to read The Little Liar. One week. Couldn't put it down. I sometimes reread what I read because it's such an unusual style of writing. They're taking notes as I was reading it and just parables. I did both. I had the audio book and I also had the physical yeah. book. I actually read the book first and then I listened to it through Audible and it was it was interesting the difference between reading the book through and I, I wanted to, especially since Mitch was narrating the book himself, I wanted to hear his tone for the truth. And, and that really kind of almost changed some of the things I read. Right now, CBS New York's Book Club with Mary Calvi. Thousands of you cast your vote to choose The Little Liar as our reader's choice. We've had the tremendous opportunity to speak with author Mitch Album about his best-selling book. Now we all want to know, Mitch, what's next in your writing? Can you give us a hint? Sure. Uh, I'm at work on my next book, which the, essentially the story is this. It's a kind of magical tale about a guy who gets to do everything twice in his life. He gets to do it once and then... If he didn't like the way it worked out, he gets a second try at it, but only twice and has to live with the consequences of the second time. So it explores that whole idea of the grass is always greener and I don't want to give away too much, but when he falls in love, uh, then he has to make some tough choices with regard to that idea. So it's a book about love and second chances and how we always think that life would be better if we just redid it and maybe it is and maybe it isn't oh boy. well we're in already i don't know danielle or liar are ready to buy the book now so it's been so exciting to talk to you get a glimpse into your world so mitch i mean really we can't say thank you enough for being such a big part of our book club thank you well uh, this has just been an incredible experience I, I feel like i know you like a member of my family we've talked so many different times about this and i'm very very flattered that the people uh, of your audience would choose my book and their their comments have have really uh, boosted me, you know, just listening to you. you don't often get to hear straight from the readers, you know, sometimes they email you, they text you, but to see them and hear them was really very meaningful to me. So thank you very much to you and to everybody in the club. Well, we so, so appreciate your time and your books too. So Mitch, thank you. Now that we are in the new year. Our top three pick picks for January. Are we ready? We're ready. So here they are. The Silence in Her Eyes by Armando Lucas Correa. A bold and suspenseful psychological thriller about a young woman with a rare neurological condition who is convinced her neighbor is going to be murdered. And when she hears that neighbor pleading for her help, she makes a decision that will test her courage, her strength, and ultimately her sanity.
We also have Where You End by Abbott Kaler. It's a spellbinding fiction debut, an unusual form of amnesia upends the lives of identical twins, forcing them to face the indelible, dangerous shadow of the past. But with it comes the opportunity to create a brand new past one world's away. Intensely creepy at times, this tale of intrigue, revenge, and the quest for redemption. And The Wildest Son by Asha Lemmy. When tragedy forces an aspiring writer on the cusp of adulthood from her home in post-war Paris, she seizes the opportunity to embark on the journey she's long dreamed of, finding the father she has never known. An unexpected and transportive story about coming into adulthood from escaping our past to the stories we tell ourselves to the ambition that drives us as we seek to find out who we are. You just got to tune in tomorrow morning on CBS News at 6 a.m. to learn more about these books. But you can vote on our website right now as for what we're going to read, our new reader's choice on CBSNewYork.com. Thank you so much for joining us today. Happy reading. Stay tuned for more updates coming up soon from Club Calvi.